Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Open Line. I'm Cuthbert Langley again, hosting tonight. I'm Cuthbert Langley again, hosting tonight for Ben Hall. I'm joined right now with two specialists. We're talking about children and mental health. Obviously, as we've been talking about, it's a discussion a lot of people have had recently, really within the last few years. So, if you have any questions at all during the show relating to your child or relating just to, to mental health in general, feel free to give us a call at the number at the bottom of your screen. That number is 615-737-7587. But we were talking in the break, kind of about some of the disorders you guys frequently see and ADHD is one of them. Can you kind of touch on what type of cases you see and how frequent those are? Well, that's really the most common childhood disorder that we see at the Community Mental Health Center. Um, these are youngsters who generally begin to have symptoms before age six or seven. Um, some of the youngsters have inattention. Others are quite hyperactive and impulsive and then some are both mm -hmm. and there really are um, it requires looking at the disorder because other illnesses can be comorbid with that and then treatment is often a combination of medication and psychotherapy mm -hmm. especially for older children I think for younger children we're probably more conservative and we plan to have the parents work with, psycho with the psychotherapist. Absolutely. And so what does psychotherapy look like for, you know, for a child undergoing that? If you're talking about a young child that includes the family system, you know, um, because we know that children very young of age don't necessarily have the words to be able to tell you what they're thinking or feeling as they're doing, they're just engaging um, mm -hmm. and they're just acting out. Um, and so a lot of it is working with the parent around um, kind of behavior modification skills um, specific to ADHD. Absolutely. And is it, as they're younger, I mean, is it more difficult to figure out, you know, are they just being a child, a, bit, a toddler, or are they being, you know, are there, is there actually something there that needs to be looked at? How hard well, is I that? Well, I think the younger the child is, you know, the more likely the behavior is to be something that's temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when we're looking at three and four-year-olds, these will usually often be children who've been dismissed from several nursery schools who are really impacting the parents' ability to manage them safely. Okay. Uh, with older children, we might see youngsters who aren't doing very well in school because they aren't paying attention. And then we see this in adolescents because it is persistent in about a third of the patients who have ADHD in childhood. Oh, wow. And is it tough to, to continue treating a child and an adolescent as they get older, as they move on from being, you know, five and six and being more into 15 and 16, that kind of shifts treatment, I'm sure. Well, it's a concern because the medications that we use are rather desirable control substances. Mm -hmm. They're very effective. They are really among the most effective medications we have. I think the other thing is that many young people will decide they really don't have a problem and that they can stop any therapy intervention and stop any meds mm -hmm. and they will continue to do fine and this is it, for the people for whom it's a lifelong problem it doesn't work out that way especially at the adolescent developmental stage because you know family becomes less and friends um, and what our um, peers think mm -hmm. becomes more you know and again going back to the the stigma of mental illness you know children no one wants to think that they're crazy you know but right. that's oftentimes the connotation that goes along with it so really working to educate the child that this is not something that is lifelong necessarily nor is it something that's going to be debilitating. And is that stigma something you've seen exacerbated in recent years, going up, going down? I mean, how it seems like there's always unfortunately been a stigma behind it. I mean, are, are there any tools to combat that, really? Well, I, I actually think that you're even having us here this evening mm -hmm. is a great sign uh, because I deal. think people really are benefiting from the media. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had many adults come in and tell me what their diagnosis is and they watched a TV show that they did the rating scale they went to the website for any number of illnesses mm -hmm. and you know they become very confident that there's a reason why their lives haven't been quite what they would have expected and it's just so nice 
to have people be more educated about mental illness. Uh, I think the other thing is mental illness tends to run in families. Okay. Um, so, you know, once people understand what's going on, they can look back in the family and see this in their cousin or someone else. So it really is something that you see running in families, really. I, I didn't really know there was a big connection there. There's a pretty big connection. Interesting. And childhood depression, we were talking about this as well. I mean, you obviously hear about adult depression a lot as someone gets older, you know, they're realizing their life isn't necessarily what they wanted it to be, but childhood depression is a thing. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, unfortunately, oftentimes too much of a thing. Um, mm. What we know, and we recently kind of got um, all of the uh, kind of the state of the union for suicides within mm. Tennessee, and th almost 13 percent um, of the individuals who completed suicide were under the age of 24 wow. within Tennessee. So that's an unfortunate side effect, oftentimes, of uh, depressive symptoms. Mm. So. And even here at Williamson County, I did a story a couple of weeks ago, Williamson County actually has the second highest number of suicides in the state. And, you know, Williamson County, for a little perspective, is, you know, well to do, a, a great community with great schools, a great economy. You wouldn't think it would happen in Williamson County, but apparently, apparently it is. I mean, right. so I mean, what factors? I mean, you know, some people would say, oh, he's got the best family life, he's got a great school life. You know, what kind of factors can, can weave their way into that? I think the most common underlying factor is really depression. Mm -hmm. So it's often uh, an underlying depression, perhaps triggered actually by some personal life event. So depression perhaps runs in the family mm -hmm. and then something happens and the depression um, manifests and then people begin to not be able to see their way out. Um, there are a lot of expectations in great schools and great families, and mm -hmm. young people are very aware of how, what the expectation is. And, but I think it's more, there's an underlying predisposition to a mental illness in most of these youngsters. And sometimes substance abuse can play a large role. Absolutely, so, yeah, so you do see there is a connection between substance abuse and an increase in depression or well, an increase even in adolescence the level of impulsivity oftentimes and the fact that they don't necessarily see you know that the behavior that they might engage in could potentially kill them you know mm -hmm. um, and so we know that that combined with the substance abuse and potentially the underlying depressive issues obviously is a, is a lethal mix absolutely well Trisha is joining us right now I hit the wrong button Hello. Live TV. Hi, Trisha. This is Cuthbert on Open Line. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. What's your question? Well, I heard um, what the doctor, I think, say that um, mental illness tends to run in families like depression. And also, the I think the other guest was saying that untreated trauma can um, develop into mental illness or, or mental disorder. So can those things really be cured? Great question. Is there ever a chance for a cure? Well, I think there's certainly a chance for cure. And we really know that in most of these, earlier treatment predicts a better outcome. So if we can approach these problems before there are too many life complications, mm -hmm. we have a lot more optimism that we might have a cure. Oh. Right. I like to use the example of a kind of a physical analogy. So if we wound ourselves on our physical body, you know, and we don't take care of it, mm -hmm. the wound could potentially get worse. If we do take care of it, the wound gets better much faster. There's always going to be a scar, very similar in trauma treatment, is yeah. that there's not ever going to be the removal of that traumatic incident ever happening. The memory will be there, but oftentimes with taking care of yourself, the wound will just be a scar. A, a great, distant memory. A great way to put it. And what about parents and families? If, if they, if the, a brother or a son is going through, or a daughter and a sister is going through treatment, how can families help them with that treatment? Well, I think the first thing is to help the young person identify that there's a problem. So it really 
often involves talking mm -hmm. very calmly and logically to your child or adolescent. So it's then uh, seeking help, and it might be through the pediatrician, the primary care doctor, through a minister. It might be calling one of the mental health centers like Centerstone directly to get help. And then often the families are involved in the family work for the treatment. It's very hard to treat children and adolescents without the family involvement. So they really have got to be there. I mean, as a part of the therapy group, I mean, kind of in what role do they play in treatment? I would say educator and supporter, you know. Um, if you don't understand what is going on with your child, what can you do to learn accurate information, mm -hmm. not web-based, solely <laughs> web-based information right. necessarily, but, you know, finding out accurate information and then helping to educate your child as well around that. You know, I think that sometimes we miss that, is that they need to understand what's going on for them as well. And then being an active support for them. If we talk about somebody having a cancer diagnosis, what do we do? We send them flowers and bake them a casserole. Do we do the same thing when somebody is diagnosed with a mental illness? Hmm, that's a great point. Well, we're talking a lot, of, a lot of great things today, all kinds of questions. If you have any, please feel free to give us a call. The number there at the bottom of your screen. We're going to take a quick break, but we're going to be right back after this.